Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Thomas, Thomas Mund. I'm one of the lecturers of this year's summer school. Uh, I would like to welcome you to this lecture. Um, the lecture will be an introduction to KNX and uh, field buses. Um, the rest of the lecture actually is yeah, kind of first person view. So I would like to leave you alone with the slides. Enjoy the rest of the lecture and uh, yeah, see you in person for the discussion. Thank you very much. The title is a bit misleading in my opinion because it's not only an introduction to KNX, it also is an introduction to building automation systems, to field buses. We need to know about those concepts before we can go into detail of the protocols. And um, I would also like to use the talk to tell you something about the differences between IoT and building automation. So general introduction of field buses, building automation system, KNX as an example and differences between IoT and building automation is the content of this talk. The objectives we have are, um, we learn which role field buses play in a variety of applications. One of these applications is building automation. So field buses can also be used in vehicular networks, they can also be used in industrial networks to control yeah, large machines, robots, and so on. We consider the, 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 <coughs> sorry, we consider the general structure of building automation systems. So we have a look uh, on something that is called a yeah, automation pyramid. Um, we have a detailed look on a more advanced protocol for field buses, in this case, namely KNX. Building automation looks like follows. So um, we have end devices, sensors, actuators. Basically, yeah, you can imagine this in a, in a building as uh, little valves that control uh, the, the flow of water for a heater. Um, sensors might be temperature sensors, pressure sensors, sensors that measure the um, content of, let's say, or the, the, yeah, the content of hydrogen in the air or of oxygen in the air of, of any gases, the concentration of those. Um, there are a lot of controllers which um, yeah, have the primary function of yeah, deciding whether to open a valve, close a valve uh, or yeah, let a, a fan run or not, uh, depending on some inputs. So they take the controllers take inputs, they are connected to the sensors they receive sensor readings and uh, they yeah, control as controllers, as the name suggests, they control the actuators, opening valves and so on. Um, there needs to be a lot of cabling um, between sensors and actuators or actually a lot of connecting or connection. Uh, there could also be uh, radio frequency or any, any other things, but in general, as we call it, field bus, in general, we talk about cabling. Um, I will give you some details about the cabling of KNX later on. And there's also there are also some protocols involved in that, which means um, we have to define the meaning and the structure of messages of let's say telegrams within a network. Um, we have to define the behavior of the system. So when I receive a message like this, what do I send? How do I reply? Do I send an acknowledgement and so on? This is called a protocol. We need to define this as well. As I said before, um, this pyramid consists of controllers on the in the in the app automation layer. In the management layer, there are uh, usually people sitting in front of monitors. Um, so it basically looks like this. Um, this this image shows the sensor readings for I think it's carbon dioxide concentration in one of the rooms. So if the lecture is getting too hot and the students are consuming a lot of oxygen, they will produce carbon dioxide, and the system needs to refresh the air, needs to run the uh, air conditioning system and um, at the end, on the management layer, uh, you can control whether everything is within the given parameters 
or you could check uh, let's say en energy consumption and have a look on the water consumption on the consumption of any consumables uh, a building would would need um, to give you an example for instance uh, this monitoring is important uh, let's assume there is a problem with the flushing system of a toilet um, so the the flush for some reason got stick so the water is running through the toilet all the time and uh, this would cause for instance the university at the current prices about 16,000 euros per year just for the water to go through yeah to go down the toilet in this case um, so not only the water goes down the toilet also the money goes um, there are also some VPN gateways on the management layer for instance um, because um, yeah, we want to connect from outside so this display as you see here could also be uh, shown on a laptop computer someone is using at home the, the facility manager is using at home and uh, hence um, yeah, a VPN connection is necessary VPN connection poses a security risk to, to make a format reference on this. Um, VPN connections are also necessary for contractors, for instance, if they want to check uh, whether the machines are running smoothly, maybe predictive maintenance or something like that. They need to download some parameters. So uh, there are a lot of people having access to the VPN gateway. Um, as I said, this is a for first forward reference for security or to security. We will consider this in a different lecture. Um, the controller backend, for instance, stores those information for long term. Uh, the reason to do so is that uh, the system can be used to, let's say, optimize some processes. So kind of a data harvesting is needed and uh, yeah I wouldn't call it big data but it's a lot of data um, the university for instance has let's say some 1, uh, 100,000 um, data points where they collect data regularly data regularly uh, and this means um, yeah the university has a huge stack or huge uh, stock of data uh, a huge pile of data they can use for optimizing something so they can predict something they can uh, yeah, optimize processes in order to save energy to save consumables um, this image here shows you for instance the, the ventilation system there are some valves in it some fans in it some sensors in it and this block diagram shows uh, the operator how everything is connected and he can directly um, yeah, access those those data and he can control the system and he can um, immediately uh, increase the temperature for instance if needed or if there's a malfunction or something uh, a malfunction then uh, in this case the system will, will put out an alert um, this management layer is also used to interconnect several buildings so um, this little mock-up here or this this model shows part of the the campus we are working in and um, there are a lot of buildings and they all have uh, building automation systems by the way we are required by law to have those systems because energy consumption is uh, an objective of, of politics so um, in this case, yeah, a LAN, a local area network is being used, IP tunnels are being used to interconnect all the buildings, all the separate building automation systems. By the way, they are from different manufacturers, they are using different um, protocols, different installations, um, so it's not very easy in this heterogeneous environment to connect everything, but this is also done um, on the management layer and uh, here usually um, IP connections are being used so a virtual LAN is being used to interconnect all the buildings and all the different uh, 
building automation systems or subsystems. Um, on the automation layer, which is the next one, we have controllers, as I mentioned before. Um, those controllers connect directly to the field bus layer down, down below to the field layer. Um, so they are also gateways for several field bus protocols. And on the, on the upper um, edge, they, they connect to the, to the management layer. Uh, on this layer, we have so-called DDC, direct digital controllers. Um, I'm pretty sure there will be a very good talk on how to um, investigate such a controller, how to do a, perform a forensic investigation on, on a DDC, uh, how to hack it, uh, given by Johan. So I'm not going too much into detail how those devices work. Uh, you might also know the term um, programmable logic controller, PLC. Um, it's basically the same thing. So in building automation, it's called DDC and uh, industrial automation, it's usually called a PLC, um, which means um, those devices have the general logic to, to control the building, to control the industrial plant, whatever. So um, usually they are installed in um, those cabinets as seen here on the right hand side. On the left hand side, we have parts of the heating system or of the air conditioning system, but in this case, it's the heating system. And uh, as you see, there are a lot of um, those orange boxes. And usually these are valves that can open and close. And uh, depending on the demand of heating in the building, uh, the controller will open one of those valves to let the water, to, to let the hot liquid flow to that part of the building um, yeah, and to enable heating of several rooms. Um, yeah, for this, those controllers have a lot of connections to the field layer. Uh, so here on the left hand side, you see the controller on top. Um, there are some manual analog inputs down below just to simplify certain settings. Uh, otherwise, uh, this particular controller has a touch screen. And on the back side, it looks like the guy on the right hand side, the right picture. So there are a lot of cables getting in or coming in. Um, and there are a lot of, um, in this case, I would say digital controllers or digital input output lines. Um, which means um, a valve is opened or closed or a motor is uh, switched on or off. Um, but there are also uh, higher layer protocols such as CAN bus, such as KNX, for instance, LON. Um, and uh, in this case, there's even a, uh, an extension device or two of them, one on the, uh, the right-hand picture, one on, uh, there's one on the uh, upper left, uh, which extends the number of inputs and outputs for that controller. Uh, yeah, let's have a bit detail or more detailed look on those controllers. This is one device. It looks like this. Um, this is another one. It looks quite similar. This one is for LON, uh, a different protocol, but basically working. Uh, with the same principles. Um, and as you see, there's in most cases, there's a local area network connected to that, or there's an ethernet cable being plugged in and IP is used to access the controllers, to access their APIs. Usually it's a web interface or maybe some binary interface, and then the controller can be configured and can be set up for, for new settings, for new temperature, destination temperatures, for instance, or desired temperatures we want to reach on that uh, controller. Or we, every, everything is controlled from the, from the management layer via IP, basically. So I wouldn't say everything, but most in most cases, IP is the protocol being used to access the controllers itself. And uh, yeah, the field bus here is on the lower left side. It's long. Um, so you see the difference. It's just a two cable or two wire cable. Um, 
which makes those controllers very cheap and makes the networking very cheap. Um, interfaces to field buses or direct I.O. Uh, so this is what I told you before. There are a lot of cables getting in. Um, I'm going to show you an overview or give you an overview about the different protocols later on. So I'm not going into detail too much here. Um, what's next? Um, the field layer. So on the field layer, we have protocols such as KNX. This is uh, what we are going to talk about in the entire summer school, actually. Um, and as you see here, there are a variety of connections. So uh, there's, for instance, access control or a variety of applications, actually. Uh, there's, for instance, access control. Um, the building is equipped with an NFC reader or with a lot of NFC readers or smart card readers, RFID readers, all the same technology. Um, so every employee, every student has one of those white NFC cards, RFID cards. And uh, if they are yeah, held against a reader, um, there, there should be some security involved. Um, and then the system reacts to that uh, person and enables either the elevator on the right hand side or opens the barriers on the lower left side or gives me access to the building uh, by opening a door, something like that. Um, we also have uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning in, in our building. So there's a valve on a heater. There's also a valve in the, in the background system. Uh, which lets the water uh, flow towards the the room the heat the heating is needed um, yeah you can imagine um, playing around gambling around with that uh, would cause a lot of trouble uh, if we set up the temperature to let's say 35 degrees Celsius in every room no one would feel comfortable um, but the the major impact would be that uh, our electronic systems, our servers would uh, fail. So uh, this could cause a lot of damage. Uh, yeah, we also have presence detection uh, or presence detectors in the building. Basically, there's one every four or five meters. These are used not only for security, uh, but uh, also for comfort. Um, when you walk through the building at night and the light is switched off, the light will automatically go on just in front of you. In most cases, there are some misconfigurations, but in most cases, the light will go on in front of you if you pass one of those infrared presence detecting sensors. And they are also connected via a bus system. In this concrete case, it's KNX. Um, what else is important? Uh, for instance, the image, the third image in the first uh, row shows you um, a German text saying attention reduced oxygen concentration, uh, access is limited. So in the server room, for instance, the oxygen is removed um, to a lower degree to, in this case, 15%. Usually it's 21% or 20, 22 or so um, in order to uh, prevent open fire in the server room. So it's very hard to enlight um, a fire um, because um, there's not enough oxygen to yeah, feed to feed that fire. And this, this might also be dangerous because it's controlled by building automation. So if the building automation decides to set the oxygen concentration, let's say to 5%, I'm not sure whether it could technically do this, but um, yeah, it would try its very best to kill people within the server room. So uh, in this case, yeah, it might be a real danger for life. Okay, so this is the field bus layer. Usually it's a structured system. Usually there are a lot of devices, actuators, sensors, as shown before. Um, a field bus is a bus system that connects field devices such as sensors and actuators in a plant, building or vehicle to communicate with an automation device. So in our case, the automation device is the 
DDC, the controller you have seen before, and sensors and actuators are um, yeah, infrared presence detecting sensors, temperature sensors, and actuators are valves and uh, fans and motors and maybe the barrier that grants access to the to the parking lot. If several communication participants send their messages over the same line, it must be defined who sends what, when, at which time. So the identifier address is needed, which defines the who. Um, the what is defined by measured values or commands which are being sent to, to actuators. And uh, when means uh, who initiates the connection or uh, which event is necessary to to send a sensor telegram or to send an actuator telegram which is meant to open a barrier or to, to read out a sensor value. Um, and there are standardized protocols for this purpose and um, yeah, there are so-called field buses and there are general uh, purpose field buses such as the well-known IE sorry, EIA485, which is a parallel protocol. You might also know it under the name RS485. It's also being used for, let's say, DMX, for instance. So if you if you run a theater or a cinema, uh, the light is usually controlled on this, uh, via this protocol or via sub-protocols running on this basic layer here. Um, for manufacturing automation, there are different field buses, um, just to name a few, I would like to name Modbus, Profibus, and in vehicles uh, we have CAN bus, we have MOST for instance, which is, uh, yeah, which is used to distribute multimedia data in a car, so if the radio is connected to the, to the amplifier and everything is digitized, uh, the digital MOST bus is being used. CAN is also used in building automation. CAN is a very universal bus system, but in vehicles, uh, it's um, yeah, it's being found predominantly. Uh, every modern vehicle definitely has a CAN bus in it. Um, in building automation, and this is the area or the the application domain we talk about, there are, for instance, lawn works. I have used the term LON before. There's Bucknet um, and there's KNX. And yeah, I would like to concentrate on KNX here. What is KNX good for? Sorry, KNX is an open standard uh, for commercial and domestic building automation. So it's not very often being found in private homes. Uh, basically, uh, it's found in industrial buildings, it's found in commercial buildings, in uh, laboratory buildings, in, in university buildings, for instance. So our building was built in or was finished in 2012 and uh, it has a KNX bus. And yeah, there's there's a good reason why we concentrate on KNX because it's uh, the, the one being used in our institute, in our um, yeah, laboratory building and uh, in our offices. KNX con control lighting, window blinds, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, security systems, energy management, and a lot of other things it can also control multimedia devices, for instance. So KNX is a very universal protocol. And um, yeah, we talk about that in the remainder of the lecture. Why do we talk about KNX and not anything else? Yeah, IoT and building automation share a variety of concepts, for instance. So um, we are going to talk about IoT protocols, but Basically, the concepts are the same. We have sensors, we have actuators, we have low bandwidth, we have uh, small devices uh, with uh, yeah, very limited resources. They don't have enough energy. Uh, we need to have a look on the, on the price tag of the installation and so on. So IoT and building automation basically on the field layer share the same concepts. There are many other protocols for building automation. We concentrate on a very popular one um, and a third reason why we talk about KNX is that we have ourselves in the group um, much experience with KNX uh, yeah, because we started to work on that and uh, yeah, we basically 
uh, concentrate on that. So when we talk about a protocol, um, we should first have a look on the physical layer. Um, so basically the cabling or if there are any cables or if there are any cables specifically being used for, for this protocol or maybe we can use existing cables in, in a case of power line for instance. So twisted pair is the um, most often used cabling of KNX which consists of a pair of wires twisted together for the purpose of improving electromagnetic compatibility so there's less crosstalk. Cables can form a three, a tree line or star topology. So basically this says um, we have to avoid circles in the topology and then we can do everything else. Um, in case of KNX there's a power supply and data is also in parallel. So the power supply and the data is in parallel on the two wires. Every device can take up to or can, can use up to 12 milliampere at 30 volts. Um, but uh, I don't want to go too much into detail of the physical layer because there's an own lecture and we also use the physical layer or we use investigations on the physical layer to detect, for instance, uh, additional devices which are not supposed to be on the wire. Um, and I think Andreas will give a very interesting talk about that. Another physical layer is a power line, for instance. So um, data is being modulated on high frequencies on AC electric power cables. So basically in Europe, the 230 volts are being used or the 230 volt cables are being used. I wonder if there are 110 volts in Europe. I don't think so. Maybe in India you have different voltages, but basically the cables are being used, you put, you put your, your hair dryer in on the morning. Um, there's also uh, a physical layer defined for KNX, which is radio frequency, which means uh, on 868 megahertz, which is a band reserve for building automation or for automation in general in Europe. In the United States, it would be 910 megahertz, and there are different other frequencies uh, available for that. But KNX is defined for 868 megahertz. Uh, it can use or it can um, yeah, send with up to one milliwatt um, for an isotropic uh, radiator. Um, the duty cycle is very limited or very much limited to 1%. Um, frequency, uh, frequency shift keying is being used. Um, CSMA is used as access control. Um, it's asynchronous and half duplex, so only one station is sending. Um, there's no, no external synchronization, so everyone can send basically on its own when the channel is available. There might be a collision, so we have to deal with that on the protocol. We don't go into detail here as well. The general concepts are the same for the twisted pair and uh, power line and radio frequency, uh, but there are some additions to power line and radio frequency due to the specific requirements those uh, physical layers have. And finally, which is not really a physical layer, uh, but often used uh, on larger premises or between buildings, uh, this is tunneling through IP links. Um, I told you before uh, in building automation, in most cases, um, IP links are being used to interconnect different buildings. So in case you want to even spread a field bus between two buildings, to have a shared field bus installation between the two buildings, um, usually tunneling through IP links is the preferred way to do. Um, let's have a small look on the twisted pair uh, physical layer. Um, as I said, energy or power supply and data on the same two wires. So in general, there's a 30 volt voltage on the two cables. And whenever a station wants to send something, it yeah, basically almost short circuits the, uh, the, the wires. And not almost, but yeah, there, there's a resistor. So um, the voltage is going down and due to the fact uh, that there is a 
not a capacity, um, an inductance uh, at the end in the power supply if the uh, station stops uh, pulling down the voltage, it, it overshoots a bit to the to the higher voltage. So uh, this is being used to indicate a zero on the cable. So as you see down below, our a zero is uh, being transmitted as one of those peaks. Um, if there are constantly ones, uh, there's just the um, DC voltage on the cable. So the 30 volts mean there's there are a lot of ones on the on the on the bus. Uh, but the, the protocol itself uh, guarantees that um, every message starts with a zero. So it starts with a peak and then the station can listen to the traffic. Um, the logical structure of a KNX network looks like follows. There are backbone lines. Um, this is an example. A backbone line interconnects uh, larger parts, in this case areas of the network. Um, the backbone line is actually a cable. So there are two wires um, in the building and um, yeah, between the, the stories, between the, the floor levels, uh, usually there's a backbone line. In our building, for instance, an area um, is being formed by all of the floors. So we have four floors, uh, we have uh, four areas uh, in our building. Um, yeah, this this also this is also being reflected by the addresses, um, which will be which will be we we be talking about later on. Sorry. Um, there's also a main line, uh, which works as the backbone of of an area within an area. Um, another cable. Uh, by the way, usually main line and backbone lines can be realized as IP connections. So um, those devices LC and BC, line coupless and uh, backbone coupless, uh, could also be a gateway between uh, KNX and an IP Ethernet interface. Um, Another thing or another structure or another element of a structure is the, is the area itself here. Um, an area yeah, basically interconnects um, devices or lines that need to exchange information frequently. So um, for instance, we are using a floor level as an area uh, has some, some advantages because usually an infrared presence detector in, in one of the floors would rarely switch on a light or cause a light to be switched on in a different floor. Uh, so that's why an area uh, limits or putting everything together into areas limits the amount of traffic uh, needed to, to go via the backbone line between areas. Um, in this case, for instance, this is a part of area three with three lines, three, 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 five, and three, six. Um, those numbers are the first two parts of the addresses. So um, to make a forward reference here, um, the area is encoded in the first part of a device address. And then um, the line itself is the second part. So there are three lines here, three, 3.3, 3.5 and 3.6 and as you see the devices are um, yeah, spread in in one of the floors. Yeah, as I said a line connects physically connects devices directly with each other so every line needs a power supply every line uh, yeah, forms a broadcast domain that means uh, every body on a line can listen to the traffic of all the other stations within a line. Keep that in mind when we talk about security, we also need to talk about broadcast domains and uh, attack vectors and the possibilities to intercept uh, signals at different locations. Um, a line coupler, as said before, is usually interconnecting two parts of the network, so it could be uh, placed between a main line and a line itself or between a main line and a backbone line if we have this 
threefold structure. Um, a line coupler looks like this, those small devices here. Uh, let me yeah, increase the size a bit. So it basically has uh, two KNX cables. The green cables are typically, uh, or the green cables are the typical color for Green is the typical color for KNX cables. So what you see on top uh, are KNX cables. Uh, they usually have four wires in it. Uh, also, I said it's a two wire protocol, but uh, there are two spare uh, wires um, just for the, just in case you want to have two lines on one cable, for instance, or um, there's the, the cable breaks and you want to use the spare uh, wire without removing everything uh, from the ceiling and putting in another cable or uh, opening the walls and putting in another cable. So that's why there are four wires usually. Uh, as you see here, this, this device in the middle uh, with the three LEDs and two buttons, uh, it comes with two connections, one on top and one uh, on the bottom. And both of them uh, connect to KNX line. One could be a main line and one could be the, the line for um, that particular yeah, installation. Um, those line couplers internally, um, yeah, as I said, they have two connections. Those line couplers internally look like this. Um, Johannes did open a lot of those uh, devices. There are a lot of manufacturers, a lot of types uh, available. Uh, basically, they consist of uh, bus couplers those devices here, Elmos, uh, it's, it's a favorite or is a well-known manufacturer for those um, KNX device coupling, um, which means you have KNX on the left-hand side and um, it uh, yeah, basically um, has a UART, so um, a serial port on the right-hand side which is then being connected to a microcontroller. Uh, we didn't talk, talk about uh, speed. Um, in this case, I, or here I would like to mention that KNX is very slow on, on twisted pair. It's only 9,600 bits per second. So a very slow serial interface will, will do the job here. Um, yeah, KNX on the left-hand side, microcontroller and application on the right-hand side, though so this device uh, serially outputs all the traffic that is available on the KNX line. The microcontroller here uh, will be used for our application later on. If it's a device, for instance, it will control the heating, the, the window blinds or whatever. Uh, but in this case, uh, we have um, actually three microcontrollers within this um, um, line coupler. Two of them are yeah, connecting to the, to the bus couplers. And one is yeah, might have some some let's say backbone controlling function. Um, so basically, we put a microcontroller between two of those uh, bus couplers. Yeah, sorry about the turned one on the right hand side. It's turned by 180 degrees. So you have uh, KNX on both ends and a microcontroller basically in between them uh, that decides whether it forwards a telegram a message from one KNX line to another. And um, this is basically the, the concept of a bus coupler or of a line coupler, sorry, not a bus coupler, a line coupler or a backbone line coupler. Uh, it decides whether it forwards um, telegrams from one line to another. It, it has some rules to do so. It has some memory. Um, in general, if you, if you uh, install such a device and do not configure it manually, it will basically forward all the telegrams from, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side and vice versa. Yeah, line couplers, as I said, um, they form a broadcast domain. A broadcast domain means if someone is sending a broadcast on a line, in this case on the physical layer, Every device on that line can intercept, can eavesdrop, can, can wiretap those uh, telegrams. And um, yeah, a line is a broadcast domain in KNX with 
twisted pair cabling. Okay, line couplers and uh, yeah, backbone coupler, the same functionality here. And there are a lot of end devices. Um, this one here with the address 2.2.1, for instance, might be an infrared presence detecting sensor, like the one here on the ceiling. This is, by the way, our office building. Um, and uh, as you see, there are a lot of those um, infrared presence detecting sensors. If you look at them, um, they basically consist of a KNX bus coupler and some hardware to detect yeah, infrared signatures of persons, of people going by underneath. And uh, in this case, a neat electrician put the address on the, on the device itself. So it is in area three on line six and the 12th device is uh, marked here. And if we look at the building plan, it's precisely that device here um, monitoring this area of the of the corridor in the third floor and um, yeah the main purpose is to switch on the light <clears throat> so once again line 36 um, if we connect all the devices virtually so the the red line here is a, a virtual cable I, it does not mean uh, the cable is lying like this it simply means those devices are being connected in this case in a yeah, more or less star-shaped topology and uh, 3.6 uh, is always at the beginning of the address which means uh, that we uh, yeah, have all those devices within one line um, basically the electrician would decide uh, which device to put on which line based on a lot of factors on a variety of factors one is power consumption so he does not want to overload the line second is traffic he does not want to have uh, more traffic on the line that the line can handle as i said 9600 bits per second is not too much so uh, if there are a lot of uh, let's say talkative devices uh, on one line the line might also be overloaded so in this case he would the electrician would also need to to plan another line and have a line coupler that uh, yeah, basically filters out unneeded telegrams to the other line um, yeah and uh, the the third factor an electrician would consider is uh, cable lengths so basically uh, he does not want to waste a lot of cables in this case, um, it's not the optimal fun uh, not the optimal or setup, I would say, because we have a lot of devices on the right hand side. We have let's say 50 meters cables, 30 meters cables to the left hand side, and then uh, we have a lot of uh, devices on the same line on the left hand side. And in this case, there's no um, IP gateway between those devices. There's a real two wire cable between them. And uh, yeah, you can you can see the cable here, the the two green cables. Um, one is getting in, one is getting out. Um, so this device is in the middle of the bus. Yeah, we have a lot of devices in our demonstrating device. We we built a little um, um, yeah desktop device to play around with with KNX. Um, so on a typical in Germany, it's it's very typical to have those so-called Dean rails, um, where the electricians put on all the electric devices. In this case, we have sensors, we have a switch here, we have a infrared presence detector down below. Um, the microcontroller is within uh, those devices, so um, they basically look like half a line coupler. So we have the KNX coupler on the left-hand side and we have a microcontroller on the right-hand side. And um, yeah, this microcontroller connects, in this case, to the, to the actual sensor, to the infrared presence detecting sensor. And whenever there's some um, event to be monitored, it will generate a KNX telegram and send it to the line. We also have actuators here. We have a controller for an LED light strip. 
I think this is the only uh, actuator we have on our demonstrator. So um, we can switch on the, light, the, the LEDs, there are two strips, we can dim them, we can set them to the right um, brightness level. And we have a lot of uh, USB adapters and computers because we want to play with that um, demonstrator. We also want to, uh, let's say, simulate some attacks. So that's why we have our computers being connected. We also use those computers to uh, monitor the bus. Um, you could uh, imagine, for instance, a intrusion detection system being connected to a KNX bus and whenever there's something unusual this device will raise an alert and that's why we have a lot of computers here on the on the bus and um, yeah basically they are also devices because um, they connect to a line and they have a, a, an address um, if they want to send something or they they listen they just listen to to a line in this case they don't need an address but um, as we always want to send something over the bus they they behave like normal um, devices we also have a knx serial adapter here um, which allows us to plug in a serial cable uh, we also have um, some knx to usb adapters on the on the network so we can we can plug in notebook computers we can plug in configuration devices we can plug in certain software um, or we can plug in certain hardware with some software on it um, to control to set up everything uh, and for that purpose usually in a um, well-maintained building automation network there are a lot of those open gateways available for let's say service technicians, for electricians to connect their devices and to yeah, interact with the bus system. In case of our building, there are at least one, there is at least one um, KNX to USB adapter on each line, so um, an electrician could connect to each line directly without, let's say, opening the front plate of a light switch to to access the two wire cable. Yeah, and now we go into detail about the protocol. Yeah, as I said before, the protocol is rather easy, which means uh, there's no, there are no complicated sequences. Uh, but in general, when we talk about a protocol, we have to talk about message formats. Um, so the structure, the internal structures, the, the internal structure of the of the messages, which means uh, which bits have which meaning and uh, how they are ordered and uh, are there any delimiters to split the the the, me the message or the the telegram in this case into parts um, we also have to talk about the sequence of messages so uh, which means this is the the dynamics um, so who is sending which message in which event and uh, yeah, as I said before, there are acknowledgements and there might be error messages. So everything uh, regarding this yeah, behavior of the protocol has to be defined in the protocol definition. We also talk about uh, error preventing and handling. So uh, just in case maybe a checksum doesn't fit, uh, what happens? Is there a retransmit? Is there a negative acknowledgement or something like that? In general, the KNX frame structure is very easy. So this is for the twisted pair frames. As I said before, there are other physical layers and uh, other physical layers have different or slightly different frame structures, but um, only to address the differences of the physical layer. So in general, it's it's all the same. Um, on twisted pair, the KNX packet starts with a control field. Then we have source addresses and um, yeah, destination addresses and so on. So we go. We will have a look into detail here. Um, so um, yeah, the the uh, control field starts with uh, a delimiter, 
so the start bit is always zero. Uh, if you remember uh, the, the physical layer, if you remember how uh, those zeros are being transmitted, uh, this means a zero is the first peak that determines the beginning of a frame. Uh, otherwise, if there are always uh, ones on the on the cable, um, there is a constant current of 30 volts, and um, this zero uh, air causes the the physical layer to or the voltage to go down for just a few milliseconds or nanoseconds. Actually, um, yeah, as I said before, this is the first zero, the start. Then we have uh, those eight data bits um, in the control field. Um, so D0 to D7. Um, please make sure you have the right bit order. Um, yeah, different protocols use the network in different bit orders. Uh, but here we start with the least significant bit first and the most significant bit. Uh, will be the last one. Um, yeah, then we have a parity bit for error dis detection, which is, um, I guess, even parity. Um, I'm not sure about that, but I guess uh, it is even parity. So uh, if there is an even number of uh, zeros, uh, there will be a zero in the parity bit. And there's a stop bit which is always a one bit. And then we have uh, two pores bits, which is uh, which are actually not being transmitted. Uh, so this means before the next character can be transmitted, two pores bits follow. Um, so uh, there is a pores in the transmission of 1.35 milliseconds. Uh, remember, the bit rate is 9,600 bits per second. Um, so as I said, the control field uh, is at the beginning and uh, here is the meaning of the uh, several bits. Uh, bit zero is unused, it must be zero zero. So together with the start bit, we have three zeros usually at the beginning, um, except for some, some other uh, specific protocol uh, messages, but in general, it's uh, always zero zero. Then we have priority. Um, which in most cases is 1-1, one, one, uh, an unused bit and a repeat flag, which uh, is zero if uh, the message is repeated. Um, then we have a poll data or data flag, which uh, determines whether this is a poll frame, which means this frame asks a question to a device, or whether this is a data frame that consists data already. Um, so um, kind of a challenge response uh, or yeah, question re response um, scheme here. Bit seven determines the frame type. It could be a standard frame or an extended frame. Uh, for now, we stay with a standard frame. The next field is um, the source address. The source address is in accordance with line, main line and uh, backbone line or actually it starts with the area, the line and the device. So within area three, all devices will have a three in the first four bits here. And then um, the line, yeah, the line we have seen before was six. So 3.6 uh, will be determined by the first byte. And then we have eight bits left for the actual source address of the device within a line, um, which might be from zero to 255. An example address 3.6.12 might be a good source address. Um, the next field is the, is the destination address. And there are two types of destination addresses. One type is uh, that we use group addresses, which is yeah, kind of a multicast address. So everyone that participates in a multicast group here will uh, receive telegrams addressed to this group address. And uh, line couplers will be enabled for certain groups 
if there are group members on both sides of the line coupler. So uh, they are set up to let certain group addresses pass as destination address and others um, they will block. Um, in this case, which is the um, yeah, most commonly used case, uh, we have a one in the address type field, which is the first bit or actually the last bit in that order of byte seven, uh, sorry, of byte five. Um, so if there's a one, it means the address is a group address. If there's a zero, it's an individual address, which is rarely being used, as I said, but for configurations, for instance, uh, a group address can be put into the address field. And this follows the same uh, scheme as described before. So we have um, the, the area, the line and the address within the line. Um, yeah, example here, for instance, um, we have a group address um, in order to distinguish between group addresses and individual addresses. Group addresses use the slash as a separator between the, the different parts. We have a ma main group, a middle group, and um, yeah, within the group we have the specific group. No, not within within the middle group we have the specific group. So one point two. Uh, sorry, one slash two slash one hundred twenty one is a group address. Um, not necessarily, but in most cases, um, yeah, those those group addresses reflect the type of devices. So the one, for instance, as the main group, is usually being used for lighting equipment, and uh, the two might be for heating. And uh, yeah, this this is quite yeah good practice. Uh, or best practice approach um, so that electricians know um, which group address to be used for which purpose. Makes it a bit easier to comprehend a network if you look at the um, structure in a yeah, setup program. Um, to have a look on, on group addresses, um, so here's an example. The devices with the error are part of the group, in this case, 1 slash 2 slash 121. So as you see, they are placed in three different lines. And uh, in our example, the line couplers here have to be set to um, a grant access for this group as destination address. They um, won't filter um, those group addresses, they would let telegrams pass that have this group address as destination address. Um, the backbone or area coupler uh, is set to block that group address, so it won't pass that, that area coupler here, or actually that um, backbone coupler, area coupler is an unofficial name. Um, the idea here is to limit the propagation of telegrams um, to the area where it is actually being needed uh, and to avoid extra traffic on uh, external parts of the network which do not need to receive those messages. So if for some reason, for instance, KNX device 2.1.5 in the lower left uh, needs to receive or needs to be part of this group as well, in this case, um, you also have to set up the area coupler and the line coupler that uh, they grant access for this group address. Um, this is usually being done in a configuration software, and I'm pretty sure Johannes will tell you something about um, the software, how it can be used to um, yeah, set up the network, um, because he needs this for some security explanations. Um, in this case, the source address is 3.1.5 and the destination is 1.2.1, uh, sorry, 1 slash 2 slash 121. Um, the telegram is being put on the line, um, passes the line or traverses the line, and then it arrives already at the device which is uh, within the same line. And uh, yeah, it is further being propagated to the line coupler, and the line coupler lets. Uh, past this, uh, uh, it, it propagates on, on the backbone line here and the next line coupler also uh, grants access for this telegram. So um, another copy is being sent 
yeah, to line 3.2 and um, yeah, the backbone line still propagates the telegram. Uh, so the second device is being reached. The same happens at the upper right line coupler. So a telegram is being sent to line 3.3 or a copy of the telegram and uh, the telegram remains on the backbone line and um, the area coupler will finally destroy or will block that telegram um, as you will see in the next animation here and uh, yeah the telegram goes down line 3.3 and after that step it has reached all the telegram the copies of the telegram have reached all the destinations so all the group members now are aware of uh, the message so that's how the uh, group address works uh, we have a route encounter um, the route encounter determines how many hops remain. The counter is decremented every time a frame passes a coupler at the value of zero. The frame will be removed. So it's kind of a time to live. Those of you who are familiar with uh, TCP, no, sorry, with IP, for instance, um, will know that uh, there's also a time to live in version three or uh, four, sorry, version four, or there's a hop count, maximum hop count in version 6, which has the same um, purpose as this yeah, routing counter. So passing a line coupler is considered to be part of a routing process. Um, the data links fields describes the number of information bytes in this frame, starting at byte uh, number 7. Um, the data starts at byte 7, so this data length tells us how much data is in the frame. Um, then we have the uh, TPCI, um, which is a control structure. Um, so it tells in bit 7, if it's 0, the telegram is a data packet. Um, and if it's set to 1, the telegram is a control data packet. Uh, so it does not contain actual data. It's used to set up some devices or to um, yeah, control something. And D6 defines whether the telegram whether the telegrams contain a sequence number or not. So for instance, is there if in case there is a longer message which does not fit into one uh, single frame into one single telegram. In this case, uh, the the uh, sixth bit here will be set, uh, D6 will be set uh, so that uh, we know there is a sequence number at the, at the end. Um, this is the detailed meaning of this um, TPCI uh, field. Um, there's another one which is called the Application Protocol Control Information APCI, um, yeah, which is the service identifier for the application layer, it tells us um, yeah, if there's uh, something on, or what's what's within the, the frame here, or what's within the telegram. Uh, I forgot the, the sequence number, uh, as said before, if there's a sequence number, the sequence number has four bits and will be incremented with every single frame that uh, yeah, guarantees the order of frames if reassembled. The APCI can either be 4 or 10 bit. Uh, so if it's 10 bit, uh, then there will be an extended APCI. Uh, on the next step in the animation, there will be a complete list of the meaning of those APCI. So we might have group value read, group value response, individual address read and writes. Um, so we have memory reads and writes. Uh, user memory, reads and writes, links, reads, uh, everything uh, for the internal um, setup of devices, for instance, is also being encoded here. So this basically tells um, what the telegram does contain. In most cases, it will contain a read or a write for some data. Um, yeah, and then we have the data itself in the telegram. The information data are the telegram payload. 
The size of this field can range from 0 to 14 bytes for standard frames. In case of 0 bytes, the extended APCI can hold the data already. So as you have seen, uh, if it's not extended, then there's some room and this can be used to, to put some data. For instance, if you want just to set or to switch on a light, you simply need one bit. You switch it on with bit one set and you switch it off with bit two, uh, with bit, bit, bit uh, one not set. Uh, so set to zero. Uh, in this case, uh, the light is going off. Yeah, the checksum at the end uh, of the frame is calculated by x or in all bytes and at last by ff. So you xor uh, all the all the bytes in the frame and um, at the end you put an xor uh, ff on it and then you put the result here. So it's a very simple checksum and the checksum obviously does not contain itself. So uh, if there are bytes 1 to n, uh, the checksum is built from the first byte uh, to the end, to the, to the byte number n, but uh, will be then added at the end and does not count. Um, yeah, how about data types? Um, there are so-called data point types. Um, a data point in automation usually is something you can measure. So for instance, a temperature value for a given room uh, where when one sensor is being placed is a data point. And a data point type consists of the format, the encoding, the range and the unit. So the data exchange through data points shall be standard in form, encoding, range and unit. There are defined in data point types, DPT. And uh, in the standard, there are a lot of predefined data points, for instance, for temperature values, as uh, I said before. Uh, there will be an example on the next slide. Um, yeah, the format itself describes uh, the sequence and length of the fields, each consisting of one or more bits of which the data type is built up. The encoding describes how the data that shall be transported using this data point type is coded using the given format possible for each field. So for instance, it might tell you that there is a mantissa and an exponent um, and the value. So it defines um, how those bits, if it's a um, yeah, regular number, how those bits are being encoded in that field. The unit in our case might be degrees Celsius and uh, the range before that uh, will tell you where what is the data range so between let's say minus 100 and plus 100 uh, degrees Celsius might be the range. Um, here's an example for a heating device, a hot water boiler has a data point and the data point type here that is being used is a two octet flow temperature in degrees Celsius. Um, the format is defined as S, uh, then three E and a lot of M's. Uh, the S is the sign, it could be either positive or negative. This is uh, described in the encoding. Uh, the E is the exponent and M is the mantissa. So the value is uh, either minus one times or one times. Um, yeah, the, the mantissa, uh, yeah, and the exponent uh, at the end. The range in our case might be from minus 276 degrees to plus uh, 65,536. So it's a 16-bit uh, number. And uh, the negative range is uh, actually delimited or is limited by nature. Um, this is the absolute zero. We can't get any, any further down. So that's why no value uh, past or below minus 276 degrees makes any sense. Yeah, there are also acknowledgements, which means um, the receiver of a data frame shall only transmit an acknowledgement if the receiver frame is consistent or is considered valid according to the data link layer specification and the value of the acknowledgement request flag is one. Um, in case there's a group address, uh, acknowledgements are rarely being used. In case of, let's say, setup frames, which are being used to set up 
certain devices, um, this acknowledgement flag is usually being set. And um, those um, telegrams are being sent to individual addresses. And here it makes uh, a lot of sense to, to have an acknowledgement while as uh, for a group address, yeah. It is possible, however, uh, a maximum of one device shall answer, but um, yeah, usually uh, it doesn't mean anything because um, if one of the receivers answers, I, I did get a copy, it doesn't tell whether the majority or all of the devices get a copy of the message and a consistent copy, which means uh, a copy that is consistent in terms of the parity bits and uh, the checksum at the end. Uh, let's have a look at first security considerations. I already mentioned uh, broadcast domains. I already mentioned uh, whether telegrams are being encrypted or not. Canix telegrams can be signed or encrypted thanks to the extension of the protocol that was developed starting in 2013. But currently, I personally have not seen any installation where um, authentication and um, encryption of data has been enabled. Um, so basically in the real world you find a totally insecure network in terms of authentication and encryption. So you can basically connect to the two-wire cable and uh, yeah, eavesdrop all the messages and you can also insert some messages which uh, is uh, caused by the lack of authentication. So there's no signature on the, on the, on the messages itself. Canix data security or data secure became an EN, European uh, Norm Standard uh, in 2018, KNX IP Secure and ISO Standard in 2019. Uh, we will have a look into detail about this later on. KNX provides an easy to implement protocol. It requires limited network infrastructure. Devices can be implemented with simple microcontrollers. That's the conclusion of this lecture. If you have any questions, send me an email ask me directly in the conversation. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope it was not too boring for you. I wish you uh, a pleasant ongoing summer school. I hope you have learned a bit. If not, uh, yeah, ask me questions and I can go into detail about most of the things I have discussed here. Thank you very much for listening. See you next time. Bye bye.